tell me, oh, what bothers you more? That your greatest failure has returned from the grave? Or that I've become a better Batman than you? I'm here to talk to you about one of my all-time favorite Batman movies that stars one of my all-time favorite Batman characters, Batman Under the Red Hood. Now, Jason Todd has always been one of my favorite Batman characters. And I'm not just talking about his time under the Red Hood. Even when he was some snot-nosed punk who was supposed to be Dick Grayson's successor. I was a fan. I'm probably going to go into the subject a little bit more in the future, so I'll save my praise for that. My point is, is that when I heard that they were making a movie based on good old JT, and two of the greatest stories to ever feature that character, you can bet your ass I was hyped. But did it live up to my expectations? Well, you're about to find out. The movie follows the comic book of the same name, while incorporating a lot from Batman Death in the Family. Which makes sense considering the main character dies in one, and is then resurrected in the other. I would say it's mostly faithful to both books, but to a degree. The movie isn't exactly a panel-for-panel, shot-for-shot remake of those graphic novels. Instead, it's its own adaptation of those events. There's a lot of plot points that don't get brought up, or are just completely retconned altogether. Which is a damn shame, because I I'm sure Ambassador Joker was a highlight for many of us. In addition to using those two stories, it also ties in elements from The Killing Joke, referencing Joker's backstory and his time as the Red Hood. In trying to link these stories together, I think this movie becomes a different story of its own. Combining the story from these comics together does a lot in terms of world building, and adding an interesting background lore to the main story. And having these stories vaguely connect better serves the narrative. There's this really interesting chain of events, and that chain is forming a circle. A full one. It's not like a triangle. A triangle has like a corner in the end. This one is a circle. Okay, we get it. Batman kills Red Hood. But this leads to his second life as the Clown Prince of Crime, the Joker. The Joker kills Batman's sidekick, Robin. But this leads to his second life as Red Hood. Batman's failure in saving the original Red Hood led to the creation of the Joker. And Batman's failing in saving his pseudo-son Robin leads to the creation of the second Red Hood. Because it's a circle. Yeah, we heard about the circle. Yes, we're yeah. familiar with shapes. I think this movie properly portrays Jason Todd. The movie is a perfect exploration of the Jason Todd character. If you ever need to catch up to date with your Robin lore, if you ever want to familiarize yourself with Jason Todd, this is the movie for you. As a boy, he's shown to be overconfident, beyond cocky, and has his fair share of attitude issues. And then when we see him later as a man, somehow he's even more cocky, but with like a touch more of arrogance. Despite maturing, his immaturity is still evident. He's still far too headstrong. His actions in this reflect a man who's both emotionally and mentally stunted. While he's grown, he still acts like a vengeful child. That Bruce tried to break of that mentality. Despite being a full-grown man at this point, He's still a kid desperately trying to get his parents' attention. But what's even worse is that Jason is a huge threat. He's learned Batman's every move, he's trained right under him. And while he's adapted Batman's physicality, he never adapted his mentality. You know, I think, uh, I think a lot of people will admit that the Jason Todd character has always been filled with a certain teenage angst. And unfortunately, he's never really outgrown that. This. What's green and purple, but covered in red and yellow? You! When I land on your sorry butt! 20 rounds a second and you were still too slow. I personally always thought that had Jason stayed under Bruce's training, he would have to some extent come around his way of thinking. After being proven the value of life, he'd be less violent and Punisher-esque. But unfortunately the Joker would prove to be the monkey wrench, or I guess, in this case, Crowbar, thrown in. Joker forever stunted Jason's mental development, as well as his literal life for a time being. His interference forever changed Jason. We're sending your boss a message. Okay. What's the message? I said sit down. You wanna die? There's easier ways to kill yourself. Yeah, like yelling at the guy who's holding the AK-47. Hey! Critical says I'm only supposed to be on the ground for six minutes! It's okay, I won't be staying that long. In a way, Batman, this was the site of your first great failure. Maybe your greatest. 
but certainly not your last, right? They're all assassins. And what are you? I'm cleaning up Gotham. Okay then, nice night for a run. Jason is often remembered as being a bratty punk from the streets, known for his always fight and never flight personality, but very often forgotten is just how surprisingly intelligent and crafty he can be. This movie's whole sequence of events is all to Jason's design. He sets his dominoes up and he watches as they fall, exactly into place. Throughout the movie, Jason uses his brand new identity to lure out the two he holds responsible for his passing. Those of course being Batman and the Joker. Taking on his own murderer's old persona in order to pique his interest. Taking Black Mask's power and profit in order to manipulate him into releasing the Joker. Showing off his skills in front of Batman to make his presence known. Look, all I'm saying is that the guy did a whole lot of thinking before putting this plan into motion. The plot reminds me a lot of Hush. Except, you know, good. Think about it, new masked man in Gotham utilizing the rest of Batman's rogues gallery for a grand scheme and big reveal? Sounds a little bit familiar. Not to mention that Jason Todd was actually a red herring in that story, which revitalized interest in the character, so... The two are tied together in some form or another. The movie's Joker is personally one of my favorites. It seems to take some inspiration from the design of the Dark Knight's Joker, which makes sense as it was extremely popular and only about two years old at the time. But despite his look, he has a personality all his own. I like that this Joker was just a cold, callous joke teller. He was a comedian who used bullets as a punchline. This interpretation showcases the character's complete unpredictability and unnerving worldview. This version of the Clown Prince of Crime spotlights the character's astonishing inability to take anything seriously. I'm sorry, could you hold on? I was just in the middle of setting fire to your gang. May I have some water? I'll need some guys. Not these guys, because, well, they're kind of dead. I suppose I'm going to have to teach you a lesson so you can better follow in his footsteps. Nah. I'm just gonna keep beating you with this crowbar. You look good. Been working out? You could probably use a little sun. Then again, who am I to talk? Go ahead. You think I care if that scum dies? Don't know. I just wanted your attention. He's cruel, he's relentless, and even worse, he performs a full stand-up set during. Even as the former Robin is getting his revenge on his would-be killer, the Joker manages to make the whole experience bittersweet by laughing along to the pain that's being inflicted on him. It doesn't even phase him. How does that feel? Uh, you know, it only hurts when I laugh. And while he can damage him physically, you can't break the Joker mentally, because his mentality is already shattered to pieces. He even bizarrely enough shows some sense of pride in Jason as he's inflicting his vengeance. As the blood from a crowbar beating is filling up his lungs, He's painfully laughing away at his own terrible one-liners, sneaking jokes in in between gasping for breath. This Joker is chaos incarnate, showing no loyalty to anyone he's ever worked with, double-crossing Ra's al Ghul in the flashback to serve his own agenda, and then again later when he sets Black Mask, the man who freed him from Arkham, on fire, proving that there is no negotiating with a madman. This man is on nobody's team. And I gotta hand it to John DiMaggio, because he's just giving it his all here. If he's not in my top five Jokers, he's at the very least in my top six, and I stand by that. It's such a perfect blend of sinister, but also... fun. In its own horrific way. It's like, the crimes the character commits are dark and heinous, but otherwise he'd be a real pleasant guy. He's got some jokes. This is not just a good Joker performance, this is a great Joker performance. Two thumbs up! Bruce Greenwood gives you everything you could want from an aging Batman slash Bruce Wayne, but the problem is, is I don't really have a whole lot to say about it specifically. It was really good and it was perfectly on point. That's really it. That's less a fault of him and more a statement about the movie, because Batman isn't really the focal point here. I mean, he's the titular character, but, but he's not the main character. This is much more a Robin movie than it is a Batman movie. I think we're good. No. You're anything but good. What the hell took you so long? 
Shut up and fight. Mr. Bruce, you can't blame yourself. You... It was stupid and careless. Remember how distraught you were. Even I found it hard to... Stupid and careless! A day doesn't go by when I don't think about subjecting him to every horrendous torture he's dealt out to others. And then... end him. He doesn't bring anything new to the table, but... He doesn't really have to. What he does with the character, he does very well. I'd say it's one of the better Batman voice performances I've heard. The guy doesn't quite hit Conroy levels, but... Who's reaching for the sky here? Rachel Ghoul plays a minor but intricate part in the story. He's played by Jason Isaacs, who's been my favorite roles in numerous movies, and I think he really did the guy justice. As did the movie itself. I was in the midst of toppling the economy of Europe. But you were on to me. I have returned your son to you as a blight upon your house. He burns the very kingdom you... You've never shied away from drawing blood. True, but always with purpose. Always with greater goals. This was simply an unnecessary casualty. I'm so thankful that he wasn't turned into some cartoon campy villain seeking world domination. Like some other iterations make him out to be. Here he's shown to be a civilized man who went to extreme means to try and save the world. In his own unique, highly illegal way. I think this is really important because this is one of the very few projects to properly capture Ra's al Ghul's humanity. Having accidentally played a part in Jason's demise, Rage is so distraught and guilt-ridden that he actually gives up a life of crime in order to not further harm or damage Batman, the adversary who he respects so much. My one gripe with this is that they really don't get to do a whole lot with the character. The guy's got like two to three scenes max and then he disappears into the night. Not unlike a certain caped crusader we know, but he's there for as long as he's really needed. And he doesn't overstay his welcome, so... Black Mask is also pretty funny throughout. He did what? What? Oh, good. He's pissed. Don't be nervous, kid. But if you keep staring at me like that, I'm gonna cut your eyes out. Ah! You wanna tell me why this guy ain't dead? I remember being surprised the first time watching this because this was one of only two times I had ever seen the character outside of a comic book at that point. Now, we've actually had several live-action portrayals of the character, so... Times, they are changing. What I enjoy about this movie is it's not entirely shallow. There is some depth to it. It is the host of a lot of interesting relationships. Jason and Bruce have a sort of familial bond. Despite not being blood-related, Bruce always brought Jason up as his own. And despite the fact that the two are feuding, and from an outside perspective may look like they're actually trying to kill each other, they're mostly holding back. When you pay attention to what's going on, Jason only really fights Bruce in order to facilitate his own plan. There's even a moment where Jason feels nostalgic, when he's getting to fight off foes with his old mentor, getting to fight together as the dynamic duo one more time. He's not trying to kill Batman. Well, I mean, I guess until the climax. Don't see how shooting a bullet at somebody when they have their back turned is cry for help, so... For the most part, Jason fights Bruce, not to harm him, but again to get his attention. At this point in life, Jason feels betrayed. Not because Bruce didn't save him, but because Bruce didn't avenge him. Avenge me. AVENGE ME! No! Despite all the Joker has done over the years, the countless deaths that he's responsible for, the family that he's taken from Batman, the friends who he's taken out of commission, even the death of his own son. Batman still never killed the Joker. It was against his code. There's no hate between these two masked vigilantes. As a matter of fact, their fights come from a place of love. And, you know, resentment. But you'd be surprised how often those two things go hand in hand. I gotta say, I missed watching you work. Even after everything Jason has done, by the end of the movie, Bruce is still unwilling to take down the tribute to him that hangs in the cave, choosing to recognize his good contributions and not sum him up by his, well, worst. The movie also showcases this interesting dynamic between Ra's al Ghul and Batman. Despite being opposite sides, there's a certain amount of civility to them. It's just so formal and nonchalant, even given the darker circumstances. Rage feeling partially responsible for Jason's death feels a big sense of remorse 
and even attempts to bring him back to life with the use of the Lazarus Pit. This is a villain trying to make things right and saving a hero. I just like the way that this was put together. It's very Charles Xavier and Magneto of them. They're opponents, but not enemies. The movie's characters exist in a gray void. There is no black and white. The characters are simple to describe, but complicated to express. What I really like about this movie is that, through the different dynamics and the character motivations, more than being painted as heroes or villains, they're shown to be people. In this movie, sometimes the good guys do bad things. And sometimes the bad guys do something good. They're not written to be supreme symbols of right or wrong, good or evil. They're just people. Fucked up, flawed people trying to do what they think is right. Or in some cases, what is right for them. And I personally like when stories give their characters that level of depth. I think my favorite part of the movie is that it asks a question that I don't think it ever really fully answers. Instead, it has the audience decide and come to their own opinion. Did that little dive in the Lazarus Pit warp his mind? Or was Jason always headed down this path? When you think about it, despite Bruce's best efforts, Jason always chose violence. The two were fighting the same fight, but doing it using different means. Their ideologies and methods of justice were already conflicting as it was, leading to a lot of arguments and a bit of a rift between the dynamic duo, which I also think adds more to the main conflict. Because in a lot of ways, Jason is actually trying to break through to Batman, trying to prove to him that his way works. But what separates the two is that it's at a cost that Batman isn't willing to pay. Batman is not willing to become a criminal in order to take care of criminals. Whereas Jason, I mean, let's face it, when he first met him was already halfway there. I also love that not all the big moments here include Batman. This is a Batman movie, but... Everyone else seems to shine as well. Well, for the most part, but we'll get into that in a second. There's a big showdown on a bridge between Red Hood and the Joker, with Batman nowhere in sight. And it is one of the highlights of the movie for me. However, there are a few elements I don't care for, and am otherwise confused by in this movie. For one, I question how everyone from the Joker to a common criminal knows that the second Robin died, and the first one went on to become Nightwing. This isn't exclusive to the movie. This is a problem I've had when it's brought up in comics as well. Why would anybody know that? Why would anybody who doesn't know the Bat Family's secret identities know that the first Robin went on to become Nightwing? Like, who does that make sense to? What, did the guy put out a memo? Did he head down to Bloodhaven with flyers? He name-dropped Batman as a hero reference on his resume? I don't, I don't understand. I mean, like, from an outside perspective, why wouldn't they just assume all the Robins were the same person? They all look alike, and they're all around the same age when they're Robin. Their identities are supposedly concealed by those masks. Like, why would anybody know that Nightwing was the first Robin in the first place? This bothers me. How did they figure that out, but they can't figure out who it is under the mask? You're not- Oh, bird boy, you're so much less fun now. All grown up and in your big boy pants. The pretty boy in the leotard. That's Nightwing. He was the bat's first sidekick. The first Robin. Still, better off than his replacement, right? Even tougher making with the yucks when you're worm food, huh? And speaking of Nightwing, if there is any character this movie does dirty, it is absolutely him. And as much as I hate to belabor a point... And still, that is often exactly what you do. I'm chatty, as part of my charm. Packs quite the punch for a toaster on steroids, huh? You know what I missed most about running with you? The toys. If you're behind this in any way, we will find out. He does not get the proper appreciation. Despite being pretty well performed by Neil Patrick Harris, he's depicted as being completely ineffective. Even though the guy is already Nightwing, He's still treated like a Robin. Batman's always leaving him behind with no way to follow his tracks. He barely has any place in the story because for the most part he's sidelined. I mean, the guy just gets injured and he's taken out of the movie. He was useless here and I have no idea why. Need a hand? No. Okay, well, how about I just stick around and watch? I wouldn't be offended by a few suggestions. He has the same weak points as a human being. Got it. Ah! 
right. Leave me with them. Could you just once say, let's get in the car? Is that so hard? Is that gonna hold? No. So you want me to, should I? Okay, I'll just take care of this. Bruce, I can still help. You already have. Thank you. Like, why even include him at that point? You wrote Barbara off with one passing reference. But you gotta show Nightwing the first boy wonder being a second-rate boy wonder? I guess it's to make some sort of cheap parallel to Batman being an irresponsible heroic partner. You know, Jason got killed on his watch, and now poor Dick Grayson has a sprained ankle. Same shit, right? But I think it's a really misplaced story element. Nightwing deserved a lot better than this. Poor Neilwing is a useless appendage. He is the pinky toe of this movie. It's said that this movie felt they had to bury Dick Grayson in order to build up Jason Todd. The Red Hood. Might be. He bears a resemblance to the original. Betrayer. Another issue that's not exclusive to this movie, but I need to ask, why was Robin wearing a mask underneath his mask? I mean, I'm not like a fashion mogul or anything, but it's a bold choice. I also kind of feel like that many masks on, you know, it has to somewhat obstruct your view, at least somewhat. Yet he's always doing these ridiculously impressive things. I get it from a design choice, but seeing him take off his helmet to reveal his identity to Bruce, all while he's still wearing another mask underneath, I don't know. It just, in execution, it feels like it defeats the purpose. Dude, it has to be Jason Todd. <laughs> Told ya, Jason Todd. If I'm being honest with you, ultimately, Under the Red Hood didn't live up to my expectations. It far exceeded them. This movie is not just a good Batman movie, it is one of the greatest Batman movies ever made. Live action films included. I previously said the Batman Beyond Return of the Joker movie was the best Batman movie ever made, and while I still stand by that opinion, I'm gonna say that Under the Red Hood is just as good. It's, it's on that level. I highly recommend this movie for anybody who likes Batman, heroes, darker themes explored by people in spandex, or just good storytelling in general, I highly recommend checking out Batman Under the Red Hood. It is 100% worth the watch. I never did learn those manners. One bad day. I knew there was a joke under that hood, but I never saw this punchline coming. I'm here to talk about one of my all-time favorite Batman comics turned into an interactive animated movie. I'm talking, of course, about Batman and Death in the Family. I can remember seeing the ads for this and thinking, wow, what a cheap cash grab, before then immediately grabbing my cash and pre-ordering it. For those of you who are unaware, this movie repurposes a lot of footage from Batman Under the Red Hood. It uses a lot of the same animation and even a lot of the same original audio tracks. So in a lot of ways, it, it would almost seem like this was a re-release of that classic Batman movie. But it's really not. It's actually something else entirely. Batman and Death in the Family uses Batman Under the Red Hood as a backdrop for its choose-your-own-adventure story. This movie is like playing advanced Mad Libs with real-life consequences. It's a multiple-choice feature that allows the viewer to change the story they're watching as that story's progressing. And it takes some real interesting twists and turns depending on the choices that are made, both going into more depth with the story at hand, and also sinking deeper into the overall lore of Batman. Once again, depending on the choices that are made. Watching this movie, you're not just a watcher, you're not just part of the audience. You're the player, you are the decision maker. I'm the decider. And you don't just get to change what happens, you get to change what will happen. Every choice that the player makes ultimately chooses who Jason becomes. And I'm not just talking about in terms of morality. Like, we're not just changing if Batman's sidekick becomes a hero or a villain. We're changing what mantle he chooses, what name he goes by, what he looks like, what he does, and why he does it. Throughout seven potential endings, we're shown several potential aliases for the former boy Wonder to go by. From becoming Red Hood, to taking on the role of Red Robin, to, even bizarrely enough, becoming Hush. Almost anything is possible. The sky's the limit. Throughout the various different events, we're shown the likes of Batman, Nightwing, Batgirl, Superman, Tim Drake, Joker, Two-Face, Ra's al Ghul, Talia al Ghul, Damien, the list goes on and on. In one story, 
Bruce is telling his side of events to the mild-mannered reporter Clark Kent. In another, Jason is talked out of his villainous ways after meeting Tim Drake for the first time. And then in another story, Red Hood dukes it out with the Batman of Zurinar. You really never know who's going to show up from one minute to the next and what their place in the story is. If you were looking for an unpredictable Batman movie, this is the one for you. Even when taking the other characters out of the equation, this movie and its alternate events makes references to the larger world of Batman all throughout, including, but not limited to, several references of the killing joke. Some of that book's most iconic lines are spoken. Joker tells the joke that he tells to Batman in it, and utters the phrase one bad day to himself a couple times, and it is made painfully clear that it was the Joker who put Barbara in her wheelchair in this continuity as well. The story is consistently inconsistent, so it never gets too repetitive. Each new option is not only a new ending, but a new beginning to a whole new adventure. More importantly, despite the fact that this movie is trying to keep up with the viewer, and it's constantly changing its own story, the narratives mostly feel very natural. I mean, there's definitely one or two that seem a little bit out there, they're a little bit suspect, but I think they're all equally likely conclusions given the events of the plot. I gotta say, it's pretty surprising just how much comes full circle when you're given the power to make a square. The choices you make in this game not only change the narrative, but also change the narrator. Half the stories are narrated by Bruce, the other half of those stories are narrated by Jason. Choosing one option over the other doesn't just change the ending, it changes everything that leads up to that ending as well. This movie is basically the Batman Telltale games, but on a time limit. I think the interactive part of this feature is really poetic. Considering that when a Death in the Family comic was being made, those in charge literally had a pull for readers to decide if Jason lived or died, it seems entirely appropriate that players can now decide that same outcome as well as what comes next. It's also not only Jason that you get to save or slaughter. The player's decision will greatly affect other characters in the story as well, including the fate of some of the friends and foes of the Batman family. Overall, after playing through this with a couple friends and going through all the endings, I'm more than a little bit ashamed that I called this a low-effort cash grab because there was clearly a whole lot of heart and effort put into this. Yes, they did use footage from Batman Under the Red Hood, but several scenes were entirely reanimated, all so that they can serve the narrative in different ways. Animation was also repurposed from other Batman movies as well, but a bunch of scenes were animated exclusively for this movie. Yes, the voice cast returns in scenes that were already shown in Under the Red Hood, but they also came back to record lines for other scenes that were made only for this movie. Almost all of under the Red Hood's voice actors come back, with the exception of Jensen Ackles. This interactive game adds a ton of narratives and characters that weren't present in that original movie. Yes, this Batman endeavor may have recycled footage, but this isn't an old movie with a new title. Looking back on it now, everything that was done seems effortful and with purpose. They took something that already existed and twisted and tampered with it to make it their own and make it something brand new and distinct from the original. And in a lot of ways, I like to think that that's what I do on this channel with the things that I review. Now look, I'm not saying that this is a faithful or even a good adaptation of the comic book of the same name. It's not. But it's really not meant to be. It's taking that original story, but doing its own thing with it several times over. That comic really just serves as the blueprint for this movie, and every addition that was done to it makes it uniquely its own. And all of that is really just the backdrop for this Who Wants to Be a Millionaire's Ward game. And while these two stories sharing the same name have little similarities, they are alike in one major way. Batman A Death in the Family is one of my all-time favorite comic books. And Batman A Death in the Family is one of my all-time favorite interactive movies. Strike that. Reverse it. This way, please! I think it's great for what it is. The one thing that kind of sucks about this is that in order to experience this movie in all its glory, you would have to go out and buy the Blu-ray. The movie is available on HBO Max, but HBO Max doesn't have its interactive version available. 
and instead it plays through the movie on one path, and it's the most boring, straightforward, uh, roll the credits path of them all. It, it basically just plays out Batman Under the Red Hood in record time. You wind up with a much more condensed and shittier version of one of the greatest Batman movies ever made. That is what is available to you on HBO Max. So if you happen to stumble upon this entry on that app, not necessarily worth your time. I would, however, suggest tracking this down and getting a copy yourself. But I would only suggest that if you'd already checked out and familiarized yourself with Batman Under the Red Hood. Because otherwise, this one is going to spoil that one for you. I think this is a fun little game to play with your geeky friends. Or, you know, more accurately, to be alone and play with your geeky self. I think most of the narratives in the movie are fairly entertaining. So if you're a major Batman nerd who marks out to fan service, I couldn't recommend this movie enough. Two thumbs up! I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-Generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel. Can't wait to return the favor to them both. Mm.